and that's where I grew up. Um, and Wellington Street ran parallel with the Free Dairy Wall as, as it is now. I was born in the 30s. 30s wasn't exactly a prosperous time. So every other house, or practically every other house in Wellington Street was a business. That was people, you know, having to make do, having to stand their own two feet, having to earn a living for themselves. So that's why it was such a, a, a I thought, a great street in, in retrospect, looking back on it now, because there was everything in that street that you wanted, that you need. You didn't have to go out. It was nearly like a village. I, I think most of the streets in the bog side at that particular time were like that. There was 13 of us living in the house. There was a two up, two down. There was no bathroom. There was an outdoor toilet. You looked out up to the roof of the toilet. You could see daylight. There was a living conditions, a tiny kitchen. So I, I slept with my with with um, Billy Nillis, my husband, and the children in a upstairs tiny room with a, a curtain running down the middle, and my two sisters slept in the alley bed. You know, my mum and father had the alley bed, and they had my younger sister sleeping in that room. But I think that was the living conditions for most of the people in the box at that time. I loved Mill Street until I got married, and then after I got married, and I had four children before I eventually moved to. I got a house in Craigan and I was fighting to the nail to get a house in Craigan. In 1960 I moved into Craigan. You had a bathroom, you had a toilet, you had three bedrooms, you know. So I thought when I moved to Craigan that it was in heaven and I'm sure most people who got houses in Craigan or Foyle Hill where we eventually ended up thought they were in heaven too as well, you know, because coming from the conditions that I've described in the book. So because of the, the lack of children to play in facilities and everything else, <laughs> that we didn't have in Craigan at that time. A group of us came together and started a tenants group, tenants association, <coughs> and, and that led this campaign for a whole lot of things. And then eventually we, we were able to get a place for the meet for it. In the initial stages we met in each other's houses. We eventually got a place to meet the matchbox. It was so small and it looked like a matchbox, sorry. But it was a great wee place. I think the first woman's group in Craigan met in the matchbox. I can name all the people there, Mary Barr and Marie Ann Mean. It was a great wee group, and I'm talking about maybe the middle 60s. I remember Mary distinctly saying one night that the only reason my husband played right was because she was going to a woman's meeting. Little did you know the things we were planning at the woman's meeting, and you wouldn't have led right at all. The only child was open and when I went up in 1960, dual day school. I mean, there was something 11,000 children in Craigan. Some children went in the morning. Now the rest went leaving of course too many children, not, not enough space. Myself and a few other people in our tennis group was a very active group, um, decided that we needed another school. We got a fellow in there, he was a parish priest at the time, to draw up some stats on the, just what I'm talking about, the number of children, correct, 11,000, the, the school situation. And we got um, Eddie McAteer, who was then the nationalist MP for, this, for the city. He took us up to Stormont, first time I'd ever been to the place. I remember it vividly. I remember going into Jerry Fitz's office in the old Stormont, and he was sitting with his feet up in the desk, and he'd on yellow socks to this day. I never liked yellow socks, I don't like yellow anyhow. As a result of that, we, uh, the, the St John's school was built. But I learned early on, not having any idea about campaign rank, but, but I learned earlier on that. Nobody gives you anything, especially the unionist regime that we live under. You have to go and duck for a ticket yourself and campaign for it, you know. John Hume arrived at the house in Elf Keelway one night. He was interested in the Tenants Association. He asked me would I join. I, I said no. I, I, well, I think I'd eight wins or something, or nine wins. Mm -hmm. and, I, and your fellow was saying, oh, it'd be great. I was looking at Billy, thinking, what? You know, who's going to watch the nine wins? Well, I tripped, I didn't know what politics involved, even. Event, and then the event, I brought it there at Thames Association meeting the following week, and they were all enthusiastic. You joined, because the Thames Association, apart from Mary Byrne, we said was all men. You know, so that was grand. I'd let the woman do the work, the usual scenario. So I joined. The other thing that happened then, Peter, my son, was killed at Christmas and that kind of helped me for six. And I have to say, just thinking today on John Hume's day, mm -hmm. the kindness of Pat Hume to me and our family, all of us at that time, I'll never forget, she, she was so good. And then that was followed then by Donahue's arrest. 
in early 1976. And um, I, I mean, Hannah's arrest was a big shock for me um, in some ways, but in other ways, when, you, when in retrospect you think back and you could have seen all the, the, the signs coming down the road, but that was neither here nor there. But the thing is that, that you know, Don has a rest. Um, made me take a hard look at what then was politics, you know. And I resigned from the SDLP. There was reasons no way I resigned. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would have stayed on, but I just felt that, that uh, I'd like to say, but maybe it's, it's not strictly true that they didn't leave the SDLP, that they left me. I just got involved then with like all the other mothers and sisters and wives and all the relatives of the committee, campaign for prisoners. And the prisoners weren't allowed anything at all. And whatever they were getting, we had to smuggle in. Mainly like sticky peppers and tops of papyrus, which you could write wee combs, which I have. Um, but it was Christmas and I wanted to take down and have something. And so I thought uh, the Turks Delight was square like that there, you know, it was a wee bar was square and it was soft. And we had to smuggle everything and, and wrap up and stretch and thing, put it in your vagina, searches them were really strict because they closed down the toilet. And that was the only way you could get stuff in. They had no hood, we're probably into it here, somebody says you can get these knickers, upper and crotch knickers. So we, we, we me, I can't, it's not going to be clear, but. We decided to, to buy them. We thought, great, you know, I mean, they're handy. I told us there was a sex shop in Belfast. Them days, I'd never heard tell of sex shops. I don't know much about them now either, but then. Mm -hmm. So we went, first of all, we went down to the old paper shop. The man looked that us, and then we realised we're in the wrong shops. The sex shop was next door. So th now, all of us, you know, we were all kind of middle aged, and we were teenagers. And this beautiful young girl, I remember as well, she came in, she looked at us as much as she said, I think you're in the wrong shop. She meant we should have been in the wallpaper shop. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, no, have you, have you, and I remember as well, because we didn't know, as you said, the word crotch, we didn't know what the word crotch meant. And we said, have you got any ladies underpants with holes in them? <laughs> she looked at us and went three heads and he was, oh, you mean open crotch <laughs> knickers? Open crotch panties and things she said. Uh, so I bought the Turkish leg and tobacco and I put massaged this, this wee square thing and they came like a cigar ship and then I was able to wrap it in the stretch and till and, it, and then wrapped up the tobacco to anyhow. And I got caught. A searcher and long hair. I always wondered was the wag her hair, it was always curled, you know. And she was very very precise and very polite. She used to say, they always ask you this stupid question, have you anything on your purse? And that was the way she said it. And I said, no. But then she, she knew you had something on my purse. And she said, man, go and send to the doctor to Lisbon to come and examine you internally with well, anything had to be worked with. So I said to them, well, look, it's Christmas. And I wanted to stick something in my son. Well, Mrs. I'm giving you a chance. I get the doctor and I get the police and you know what she would do with the whole spell. Anyhow, they got the tobacco and they got, uh, uh, and they, they didn't get the turkey's delight. I went down to Dan and there were all these screws down around you and you were trying to slip them. And I slipped the turkey's delight. And he, he was feeling it and he was under his under the table like them. He said to me, go and sit there, man. I said, this turkey's delight. And he said to me, it's changed the chips since I was in <laughs> Tiberty. <laughs> That's when we glockled, sort of, won't me then, because I'd had a, a lot of political experience by that stage. If I worked on the politics very naively, um, I, I gained it during the campaign for the prison, uh, in the prison struggle. So I joined Sinn Féin, I think it was 83. What do you think of the council, working with the council? I loved the council, I thought it was great. Um, and. I mean, I, I loved the whole sort of sparring and, you know, uh, uh, but I also kept you in touch with people. I mean, you're a counter for the people, so you're always still in touch with the people, you know. In the meantime, I kind of was doing other things, like getting Dove House off the ground and wee bits and pieces like that. I was involved with a group of young people. What were we doing? We were doing a literacy project. And uh, they, were, they were great young people. Most of them were young people who had been either expelled from school 
or who had a bad school or maybe who had been special needs school, you know. The young people who definitely were totally anti-education at the time. And I was involved in the lottery project with Karen Lenwright, who was the vice principal of Karen Hill. Karen was a great woman. So I can't remember now to this day how I knew about the house. It, was, it used to be an old people's home. It was abandoned because of the war and the bog street. They had moved the old people to William Street. But it was lying empty. And the only people using it at the stage was the Alcoholics Anonymous at meetings on it. And I went on date one day and talked to some of the men who was the alcoholics meeting. I said, oh, nobody in this place here. So I told a group of the young people, mean people who was Frankie McMenamin and Sherry Turner and Shumas, thing with my brandy well. And they said, hey, well, we gunned it. So we did. So me, I remember as well, going around the community, asking, telling people where we hadn't even a name, we're moving on the Dove House. Um, we they asked you, what would you, you what do you just need to hear in the box? And the pe thing that I remember most um, was Barney Martin, God of Mercy, and Nathana Martin, who eventually came on their management committee. Her husband, Barney, before he died, I remember asking, saying, go on and say, that's Billy, Barney, Barney, we've moved to a group of us and moved on the Dove House, we're trying to set up a community project. And we just want to know what you need. And Barney just stood back, straight back to me and says, What do you need for the box? A psychiatrist. That's what he says to me. And he probably was right. You know, and years later, like we thought of that back and thought, I'd be a psychiatrist, wouldn't have been out of place, all right, you know. So that's how Dove House came into being, you know. And I'm glad they say here it is, to the year, what year is 2020? Mm -hmm. And it's still going, you know. We brought mm -hmm. over a Dutch priest who was also a member of the European Parliament, Herman Verbeek. Mm -hmm. uh, he was really, you know, progressive and, mm -hmm. and he'd done the official opening. I used to get in touch with him. Oh, who I, Because during the, the prison campaign I'd been in touch with all these groups in Europe and the Dutch, the, uh, they were a kind of a rainbow project. The, the Dutch Parliament, Emily van Noord, Rick and Yelly, who, you know, were organising holidays for Wayne's here. So there was all these weak connections, you know, as Carmel said, when I think of Carmel, she had all these things. She used to say, you throw a stone into the pond, it creates the ripples. Mary was, she was spot on about the ripples there. So Herman came over and we launched Dove House officially. That was the day Neil Harkin died, our Tizzy's husband died. Something that day. But anyhow, Herman, we planted the tree out the front and 15 months later we looked and the tree had gone. But that was done. <laughs> but Dove House flourished. You know, I moved out of it. Uh, there's another, that's another thing you learn too, is that there's certain shelf life that you have in projects and it's time for you to go and let other people, because you get very attached to them and it becomes your thing, not other people's things, you know. So so then the next thing then was a co-op. We, we set that up there, Irish Dancer Co op. We're way ahead of our time, I think about that. But I, that was great. Maureen Shields and Betty and um, Brady Maynard, they were great people. Well, they the colour of Doherty. Um, and I mean, we went, we, the, 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 I heard someday, I think it was John, John McCourt today talking about John Human about Women's Place. The bank wouldn't let us open wouldn't give us a bank account because we were all women. Now that, what year was that? 1989? Something like that. Women still couldn't open the bank account because they were all women. It lasted as long as you could with no funding. Colin yeah. McFeely have to stay helped as all they could through the cooperative movement, but that was just before his time. And then you look later years there, Shauna Shields started the Irish dancing thing, doing brilliant work, mm -hmm. although they, they closed now because of the COVID thing. Dairy people are sociable people. You were brought up running on out to one another's houses, mixing with your neighbours, playing with it. No, you were brought up with that culture, and now you're, you're in a culture now where you don't even see a band on Monday night, don't hear a voice. And when you turn on the radio, the TV, all you hear is about COVID, you don't want to hear about it, at least I didn't want to hear about it. And the only thing that kept my sanity during this whole period was the Wednesday Street, and they didn't appear to about maybe four o'clock. And I loved just watching the winds going up and down by the wee scooters in the week. Because there was no downside to talk to. You're talking to your seats, there was even talking to walls at one stage. But there was the sound of a human voice. It was the Sunday coming on the door and saying, how are you doing? I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free. 
and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee head blade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. Dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings, there midnight's all a glimmer, and in a purple grove, and leaving full of the linnet's wings. I can describe the last five months, that's how long we were locked up. And eat, pray, we just started praying from morning to night, and bleach. I smelled the bleach, I ruined all my clothes bleach, for it's forever bleaching letters. Uh, even even the parcel that my daughter-in-law brought me on the food, you wonder, Jesus, wonder who was handling that bleach.